I try. You do well. All righty. So here we are with the Kendall Phillips. I almost called you Omar, but that is not your last name. Not anymore. anymore. <laughs> She's a married woman. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, so thank you so much for coming on the podcast. This is awesome. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. Of course. So um, usually when I have a guest on, I ask them this question. So I'm going to ask it to you. What is one aspect of God's character, the Trinity's character that has been most evident in your life? Ooh, now that changes with different seasons of life. I, for right now, I'm a mom to a two-year-old and a two-month-old, or I guess he's like three months old now. Um, <laughs> and prior to this, the whole message of grace, 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 I kind of was like, uh, yeah, God is full of grace, but you need to just kind of get your life together and be a little more <laughs> obedient, be a little more disciplined and start, stop using the grace ticket to get out of things. And then I became a mom Yikes. and that has very much been the anthem of my, um, the message I think from his heart to mine the past two years is grace very much is a real thing. And I think I was a little too legalistic and a little too hard on myself, probably a lot of other people mm. prior to this, uh, motherhood season. And yeah, so definitely the fact that grace is very much a real thing. And I still, I give my best and prior to being a mom, my best was like, it was actually pretty good. And being a mom, my best kind of looks really small right now, but that's all he asked for us to give our best. And then he truly does fill in the rest. And that's where grace steps in. And so definitely the grace message. And it's been quite humbling for me. That's good stuff. Yeah. yeah. I am not a mother. And I know you guys are just trying to do your best out here. Just so like, keep up the good yeah, work. Just trying to like create a human that's not going to like destroy the world one day. You know? Right. And make all the right decisions. But like, what are all the right decisions? No one knows anymore. <laughs> <laughs> World fought apart. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> great answer. Great answer. So, um, as you guys can see, this, uh, conversation is going to be about human sex trafficking. So I want to ask you, Kendall, um, first to kind of outline what is human sex mm -hmm. trafficking. Okay. So trafficking, think about it like an umbrella. Okay. Literally picture an umbrella. And at the top of the umbrella, you can call that human trafficking. And under the umbrella, there are different types of trafficking. One of them um, would be like labor trafficking and one could be sex trafficking. So you could say mm -hmm. human sex trafficking. You can say humor labor, labor trafficking. Um, it's two different things. Human trafficking is the general term. So labor trafficking would be the recruit recruitment and selling of a human for labor, working in fields, working in restaurants, working in the home, and then recruiting for sex trafficking is for sexual purposes, the kind that you think of like if you've seen the movie Taken, where they're like thrown in a room and they're forced to do things with their body sexually that they did not sign up to do. So human mm -hmm. trafficking is the general umbrella term and under that could be labor trafficking or sex trafficking. So people may yeah. be trafficked and never have been forced to have sex against their will, if that makes sense, and vice versa. They could be yeah. trafficked and forced to have sex against their will, but not forced to work against their will in a restaurant or a business or some sort. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes, yeah. it does. I didn't even think about the other aspect of labor mm -hmm. trafficking. So. Yeah, it's just as much a thing That's as also... sex trafficking. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Okay. okay, so I also want to go a little deeper into the sex trafficking aspect because I think like, like, I don't know as much as you do about this. Um, I think we just think it's always like someone throws you on a ship and you just never see your family again. But I think there's like smaller instances yes. in like America that's yes. happening more often than we yes. understand. So can you talk a little bit about yes, that? Yes, and you're very right. So trafficking in America looks different than trafficking abroad. Um, for example, trafficking abroad is kind of what you just explained. I worked with... I don't know if you've heard of A21, Christine Kane's uh, nonprofit that helps rescue people from trafficking, rehabilitate them, and then help them be an active part of society again. And I interned with A21 and lived in Greece for three months working with girls rescued out of sex trafficking over there. And I'm going to give you an example of what trafficking abroad looks like versus trafficking in America, because you are bringing up a very valid point. Um, and abroad, in where we were in Greece, there are countries that surround Greece that are just a lot more poor than Greece is. Greece is a tourist town, not town, country. Um, people <laughs> want to go to Greece. People love Greece. And so the traffickers will own businesses in Greece and they will go to, for example, Bulgaria is right over the border. They'll go to Bulgaria to a village that doesn't have running water. 
they don't have a, um, ways to get a job. They don't have an income. It's just the poorest of the poor. And they, these men who look very well put together will say, hey, if you will send your kid over to Greece to, for the summer, send them to Thessaloniki for the summer, and they can work in our restaurant, they can make money and bring the money back to you at the end of the summer. And the parent is like, of course, I'm going to do this. This is opportunity for my kid to have a future, have a life that I can't give them. So it makes perfect sense to trust that this well, this like well-dressed, well-put-together man is literally going to let them come work in the restaurant, make money and bring it back home to Bulgaria at the end of the summer. And what happens is the mom is like, yep, let's do it. Or the, even the, the person that agrees to it. Yes, let's Mm -hmm. do it. And they agree to go with this man back to Greece. And then it's like a Jekyll and Hyde situation happens. All of a sudden, this man who is giving them a little job in Thessaloniki little cafe for the whole summer is like, just kidding. That is not what we are here for. Give me your paperwork. Give me all your clothes. And they start the breaking in process. And this girl very Mm -hmm. much, and it can also be a boy. I'm going to refer to it as girls because that's predominantly what I ever worked with, but it very much can be a male as well. So then this girl realizes what just happened. Like you told me I'm going to have a job and make money for my family. And now you are beating me, raping me, starving me, telling me that if I try to run, you know exactly where I live because he does. You know what my mom's name Mm -hmm. is because he does. And you will kill my family. You'll kill my kids. You'll do whatever you have to do. And so he teaches her she has to comply. She can't run. She can't escape. So she knows very much so this is not okay. I am trapped. I am scared. I want out of this. Whereas in America, that isn't happening that way. Not to say it doesn't happen that way, but in America, trafficking in America, it's more of the, they call it the Romeo and Juliet type of trafficking, where girls Mm. are on social media and they are interacting, whether messaging, video chat, whatever they may do with these guys. They're building a relationship with men on social media and these men are just doting on them, giving them what they want. It's very sad that really the foundation of, a healthy country is the family unit and the family unit is so very broken in our entire world, especially our country. So you have girls sitting at wherever they want because phones are with them all the time on social media. They aren't told by their daddies or their moms how beautiful they are and how strong they are and they aren't being built up as they should be. And so they're getting that affirmation from the outside world. And these men know to prey on these girls. And so they will start grooming her and they'll show up in her messages and they will respond when she responds and they will tell her how pretty she looks that day. And she is starved for this attention. So she just keeps coming back because she's getting the attention Mm -hmm. that she so desperately deserves, honestly, but doesn't get from the right people. And then he wants to meet up with her. And so, of course, she's going to meet up with him. But now she's in love with the guy, you know. And so then she meets up with him and he creates it never becomes this Jekyll and Hyde of like, just kidding. I caught you. I'm actually a monster and I'm going to rape you and sell you for sex. It doesn't happen that way. He literally like there was a case that I didn't work with, but heard close details about in Florida where the girl literally believed that she was having sex with any man he brought into the room and he was selling drugs. And she, he had made her believe that they were raising money to be able to have a better future for themselves and go travel and buy the things they want. So when she was trying to be rescued from this situation of being pimped out to so many different men, she didn't think she needed to be rescued because she was in love with this man and they were building their future together. And then of course Mm. he drops her like hot potatoes when he's done with her and she's left broken into a million pieces and he's done with her and he goes on to his next girl. So that's kind of more of what trafficking looks like in America versus abroad. If that it's actually there's a really big difference. So I hope I explained yeah. that well. Yeah, yeah, and I really didn't understand until because I'm a therapist and I had a client who was human sex trafficked, and yeah, it's like, yeah, it's like as simple as yeah. that. She kind of engaged with guys online and just ran away from home yeah. and was gone for a long time. Just that's exactly how it happens. Out experiencing that until she came home and understood what was happening to her. Um, so. Yeah. That I think we, we, we try to like, I think it be, it seems such a, a huge issue that we can't comprehend to the point where like people just like, don't even talk about it because it's like, I, I don't even know what I would do. Yeah. So I think it's important that we're having this conversation. Yes. Um, but I didn't want to ask you what inspired you to, to kind of get involved with, uh, working with traffic victims. I think, um, two things ever since I was in seventh grade, my godmother was a counselor and I was fascinated by it. I thought it was so cool that two people could come together and 
have this connection to be able to help the person that needed help navigating a situation, the therapist could help them navigate it and come out on the other side healthier and better because of it. I was fascinated by it. So in seventh grade, I was like, I want to be a counselor. Like, that's what I'm going to give my life to. (laughs) And then I found out about human trafficking uh, years down the road. And I was just kind of bewildered by like, wait, this really does happen? Like, how does this happen? You're telling me like every night I get to come home to a safe home with parents who love me. And there's girls out there that aren't experiencing that at all. They're actually experiencing the very opposite. I'm like that's not okay at all. And so mm-hmm. something just, it struck a chord in me and then I didn't think it was okay. And I really could not sleep at night thinking I have this knowledge, but I'm not doing anything to try to help it. Even though I didn't have a platform, I was so small. I didn't have I couldn't change the world of trafficking, but I couldn't sleep well without trying to do something. So I think it was my love for counseling and then realizing that trafficking really is a thing that just struck a chord in me and I couldn't stop. So I kept moving forward. So tell the humans about what that has kind of come to look like today. Yeah. So, um, what you may know as the penny story, I call it my firstborn child. I do have two human children. Um, the penny story <laughs> is not a human, but it is something that started out simply as a trafficking awareness movement based off of what I just said. When I realized trafficking is a thing, I was like, we can't not tell people about this. Like everyone needs to know that trafficking is happening so that we can stop this. Like it blows my mind that there is a girl locked away in a room and she was beaten so hard and starved so much to the point that she's just raped over and over again every day and she can't do anything about it. And I'm over here like living my little life and I'm like, what is happening? And so what um, we took as an analogy to raise awareness to trafficking are pennies because pennies in our world, they don't have a lot of value. If you see a penny in a parking lot, are you picking it up? Probably not unless you just have a special connection with a penny. Um, It just doesn't Mm. do anything for you monetarily at all. Uh, They're kind of a nuisance type of coin. And so They don't hold much value. They blend in with our surroundings. And that is literally how victims of trafficking are treated. They trafficking is everywhere in our world. It's probably, I'm pretty certain. I don't know where you're living, not you, it's not, but like whoever's listening, I don't know where you are, but I can guarantee Mm -hmm. you there's probably trafficking in your County. And, um, we don't see it because it blends in with society. And just like we can't see trafficking, we don't see those pennies laying in parking lot. They just blend in with our surroundings. And just like the world, the girls that are trafficked believe they have zero value because that's how they're treated. That's how the pennies are. They really don't have any value. Sometimes when you check out somewhere, if it's like $2 and one cent and I'm paying with cash, they'll be like, don't worry about the penny. I'm like, no, I worry about the penny. Take <laughs> worry <my> penny. about <laughs> it. <laughs> they just don't have a lot of value. And so we take pennies. I wish I had one sitting right here. I mean, I do, but it's over there. And we stamp the word Mm -hmm. worthy into the bottom of the penny and we make a bracelet out of it and we sell it and donate proceeds back to A21, which is the organization I previously um, referenced. And we keep Mm -hmm. selling penny bracelets and we also have key rings. We have some, a few things actually, but I wanted to take that analogy of a penny being like a victim of trafficking and tell everyone about, about it. Because once you hear that, you cannot unhear it. I guarantee Mm -hmm. you the next time you run into a penny, and this is the first time you're hearing about the penny story, you're immediately going to think about human trafficking. You cannot unhear it. I don't know why, but I've been doing this since 2013. It's 2021. And that is the main thing that I hear over and over is once I think about pennies in that way, I can't not think about them in that way. And so I was like, we just got to tell everybody about this. And so Mm-hmm. I'm a, I feel like I'm a small fish in a small pond and I prayed and asked the Lord to give the penny a voice greater than mine so that we could raise more awareness to trafficking and create more funds for A21. So I was donating like $50 to A21 here and there and I wanted to donate a lot of money. I mean, 50 something, but um, it's not a lot and I wanted to donate a lot. And um, mm-hmm. a singer songwriter in the Christian industry had been praying for a way for her platform to support A21 and help end human trafficking. And she had been asking the Lord, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to write a song, go on tour? What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? And she came across this penny bracelet, just not haphazardly, but of course it was a God thing. She just comes across it and asked, what is that? And was told what it was, what it represents. And she said, this is the thing that the Lord wants me to do. Please find out who creates these bracelets and see how I can start selling them. And so she started selling the penny bracelets in 2014. And that's really what took this little baby thing off to get a more attention around America and even abroad. Because like I said, I'm kind of a small fish in a small pond. I'm just uh, from a small town in Alabama. But this, the singer songwriter is Carrie Job, And Carrie influences 
thousand, millions, not even thousands, millions. And when she started yeah. selling the bracelet, it just got a lot more um, traction. And we were able to sell mm-hmm. a lot of bracelets and create more money for A21. And yeah, so that's kind of, that was back in 2014. That's kind of what took off for when the penny story took off. And now it looks different today. Um, I still create awareness to human trafficking with it, of course, but I, there's two layers to the penny story. Now the foundation is what we've been talking about, all about trafficking awareness. And as I said earlier, my love for counseling is still very much inside of me. I have my bachelor's degree in psychology and my master's degree in counseling. And my, I love the one-on-one connection. I love the just I love the power of counseling. And so I use the penny story as a form to counsel girls because the message of feeling unworthy, insignificant, and overlooked is not just true for trafficked victims. It's true for all of us as humans, especially yeah. as women. You don't have to be trafficked to feel overlooked and unwanted and without a purpose. Like we all feel that to some degree pretty much every day. And so I was able to launch the counseling side of the penny story. Um, oh, cool. I, well, I didn't know that. Yes, that's what like my day to day is uh, now with the penny story. It's what it's awesome. much less <clears throat> trafficking awareness. Our products very much are trafficking awareness, but the service that I offer through the penny story is not counseling girls that have been trafficked. It is I call it the everyday girl. It's working with girls mm. that they have not. They're not victims of human trafficking, but they are girls that are just trying to figure out life and. I love what I do. So yeah, that's, I call it the penny story 2.0. Good stuff. No, and you're completely correct. Like I, you say that once you hear the story with the penny, you're never going to look at a penny the same. Literally. (laughs) I think I heard about that. Maybe 2014. Every time I see a penny now, I can't unsee it. I think of it. It's crazy. So you're completely correct. And I hope that happens to every single person that listens to this. Um, and inspires them as well. But I did want to ask you, like, do you feel like, this is even a big issue anymore in America or is it like I not as huge as it was before? No, I, it's very much still as big. It just doesn't get the news that it used to get back when I started back in 2013, when this all fired up inside of me, the news wasn't too crazy about it. They were, but then there was like a peak in the news where everybody felt like everybody in the world knew about human trafficking and were asking about it. And there's articles on it. Like it was everywhere. And that has tapered Mm -hmm. also. And I don't know if it's because of this pandemic that we were living in, politics, all of the things, just other things are more newsworthy in a very negative sense. Um, But no, it's not at all resolved. Mm -hmm. And I hate, I don't know, maybe I'm about to say a very unpopular opinion. um, But my thought is this world is extremely broken. I don't think we, there's no sin that we are going to see fully end, including trafficking i really don't think as before jesus comes back I'm, trafficking is not going to end unless every single human on the face of this earth comes to know jesus and maybe they will mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. trafficking is going to keep happening but i do believe there does not have to be 100 million victims of trafficking i think that number can decrease dramatically because of awareness in people that they have to do something about it and they're just going to keep doing something mm-hmm. about it until they see it change and so Trafficking is very always going to be a thing, but I definitely think it doesn't have to be as big of a thing as it is right now. Yeah. Um, and like you said, yeah, sin is going to keep happening until Jesus yeah. comes back. Um, and that's why I want to ask you, too, like, why do you think it's important for the church to even have this conversation yeah. about this? Yeah, because it's one of the most like hidden sins in the world like ever so slavery was legal years ago and they said slavery is now illegal and all of a sudden it's not like all the people were like huh that was a bad thing to do we're not going to do that anymore like dang it now we can't have exactly they just said how do we do this and not get in trouble for it and so Mm -hmm. it just continues to persist and so it's one of Mm -hmm. the i mean trafficking is like centuries old it's like the world's oldest crime so to speak and so the church plays a crucial role in the healing of any human that wants to know jesus and bring them to know the lord in any capacity and are of course victims of trafficking that deeply but like i said earlier the family unit a healthy family unit is the foundation of a healthy society when the family Mm -hmm. where the family breaks down is where the society starts to break down and our church is I think they play a huge role in that. And that's where, like in America, we aren't having so much to worry about. You take your kid on a walk around your sidewalk and you get snatched up in a van. Like we don't, that doesn't happen that all that often in America. But what happens all that often are absent father figures, absent mother figures, not being, not raising the kid in a loving, safe home 
in turn, we are having situations like trafficking happen all the time. And so the church, to me, the, one of the church's roles is to help the family be a healthy family unit, to help mom and dad, mm. husband and wife, help have that marriage be honored in the way it should be honored in the church. And we don't know how to do that. The church needs to be teaching us how to do that because a lot of us weren't raised yeah. modeling that healthily. And I think that's why it's so important for the church to have these conversations because it actually starts in the home, not anywhere else. Yeah, that's a great answer. I you I don't think anyone would think like, oh, what's the uh, what's the best thing to do to help human sex trafficking? You wouldn't think it'd be to create a healthy family, it, but it that makes complete seriously sense. Seriously, is because the girl who is affirmed at home, loved at home, safe, secure, is doted on by her daddy and her mama, and is given not the world at her fingertips, but just raised in that healthy, secure home. She's not on Instagram answering what crazy messages from joe schmo saying hey girl you look good today she's like "Ooh, mm -hmm. daddy who's who's joe schmo <laughs> tell me i look good today <laughs> daddy's like Fuck. i don't know but you delete it right now <laughs> instead of right, the girl right. who's sitting in her bed looking for that affirmation through her phone and through social media yeah and that's a lot i mean that makes it a lot easier yeah. than two for people like i can work on myself and make me myself more healthy choose a healthy spouse and do this whole creating a family thing in a healthy manner to work against sex, human sex trafficking and so many other things. Yeah. So it's not as hard as I, even I thought it was yes. it's not before either. Yeah. So that's awesome. That's cool. Good. What are, what are some other ways you think that we could help as well, other than, you know, being healthy right. and creating a healthy family? Yeah. You could be listening to this. And you're like, that's cool. I'm not a wife. I'm not a mom. <laughs> what does it say? <laughs> I'm single. Right. I have, I have, so I have what no I offspring. <laughs> what, what is it? Okay. So <laughs> I think I have, I, my answer to that would be, um, I don't know if, you heard about Wayfair. What year was it? 2019, 2020? All of a sudden. Yes. So all, everyone's like, Wayfair is trafficking people. Like, because they're selling yeah. like, the desk I'm sitting in. I don't even know if it's Wayfair. But they would be selling a desk for like $2,300. And the desk name was Juliet. And it's like, oh, mm -hmm. I want that Juliet desk. Why is it $2,300? I'm not buying a $2,300 desk. That's crazy. But supposedly Wayfair was selling humans, Juliet, for $2,300. And people that were in on this could get on Wayfair and buy the Juliet desk for $2,300. And then Wayfair would ship out a girl named Juliet. So mm -hmm. is this true? I don't know. I have absolutely no idea. Um, and then I, to this, I would say, because a lot of people stop buying from Wayfair, right? I understand why you stop buying from Wayfair. Wayfair is not my first mm -hmm. go-to, but um, our dollars being taken away from a business such as Wayfair is not going to hurt Wayfair. People are going to keep on shopping at Wayfair, <laughs> whether the trapping stuff was <laughs> true or not. Like your $100 purchase ain't going to hurt Wayfair. Um, but mm -hmm. what your $100 would do is finding your local person or local organization that's actually trying to make a difference in the community and that hundred dollars going there, if that makes sense. Mm. So I think a lot mm -hmm. of people get worked up and fixated on like, Oh my gosh, I can't buy clothes from China because the children that are forced to work made these clothes. And if that's your conviction, absolutely honor it. But you withholding the dollars from really big companies probably is not hurting the really big company and unless you're going to China to rescue these people, the, your mission field might actually just be your city and your county for right now. There could mm. be, um, I'm using the penny story as an example, but there's a, I'll use somebody else, not me, but there's somebody else in this county that helps women who can't get on their feet to get resources to pay their bills and help their kids eat when their kids can't eat. And that woman who's trying to provide for her kids, she is very vulnerable to fall prey to a man grooming her because he can provide for her kids. He can pay the bills, et cetera, et cetera. So there is an organization here that helps women pay their bills when they can't make ends meet and feed the kids. Giving your money to something like that is going to make such a bigger difference than ever withholding funds from Wayfair. But mm. I'm not saying don't do that. If that is your conviction to not buy from Wayfair, whatever, don't buy from Wayfair, but consider the yeah. people locally in your city, your county, your state who are doing their darndest to make a difference in their county. They need money. Your hundred dollars would go a long way with them. And so yeah, it's yeah. Thinking or not even your money, you might be like, cool, I don't even have a hundred dollars to my name. Your time is huge <laughs> to be able to volunteer. I used to volunteer somewhere and I had no purpose. I felt like I had no purpose there. And I'd literally be like, what the heck am I doing here? But I knew I wanted to be able, it was an organization that met with girls who had just been raped and gone to the hospital. 
the counselors went and met with the girl in the hospital and I wanted to be able to do that, but I had to volunteer at this place and kind of understand the whole world before just showing up at the hospital. And I literally mm. was like, what do I do? With like, there's nothing for me to do. Y'all, I would literally take books off of the bookcase and clean the dust off the bookcase and replace the books. Because I was just like, <laughs> I want to be around these type of people. I want to help these type yeah. of people. And my role, I really didn't have a role. So I just did whatever I could. Empty trash cans, like clean the bookcase. Because I knew I wanted to rub shoulders with those type of people. And me being able mm-hmm. to help take care of the facility in that way, that place value in that way. So even if you don't have money, you ha- you might you probably have time. I don't know. But yeah, being, time is the biggest. Right. Being able to volunteer somewhere like that is huge. So mm-hmm. I would just say look locally at what you can do to help and not so much like a Wayfair. Like if you don't want to talk Wayfair, don't talk yeah. Wayfair. But, and yeah. I think that's a good point too. Like withholding is not always going to be the most helpful. You you can give your money to places that actually help yes. rather than just not, not give your money to something like Wayfair that's going to continue to sell whatever they want to sell to their Wayfair. Right, 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 right. Yeah, that's, that's really good. Um, yeah, and I'll also post some like resources for people to... Um, Obviously, you yeah. being one of yeah. the resources um, <laughs> and other people, other places and places that they can, you know, learn about different things like this. Because I know there's one guy, I always forget his name, but he like goes into different places. He's a Christian. Yeah. I don't know what his name is, but he's like all gung ho about it. So I'll post yeah, do that. Well. But before that, what is if like these people listen to this whole episode and they only hear one thing, what would you want that to be? The first thing that comes to mind is thinking about your neighborhood little girl that literally might just need a friend to be a trusted adult in her life. Um, That I think is often underestimated. I think the Lord puts us, maybe you live like on a farm in the middle of nowhere. I don't know, but a lot of people usually live around neighbors. And um, Mm -hmm. I think work like this, like healing work, healing of somebody's heart that desperately needs it, the Lord's going to start really small, literally with your neighbors or your co-workers that you see every day, classmates that you see every day. The work starts right there. Um, and I would mm-hmm. be looking, asking the Lord to give you supernatural awareness and insight into who is hurting and broken around me and where can I step in and be a trusted person to just for them to unload on or vent on. You have no idea if you going on a walk every week with your 12 year old neighbor is actually going to be the thing that saves her. Cause she knows she can come to you one day when her parents fail her, if that makes sense. So wow, that's beautiful. It's so true though. I mean, it's so true. And I don't know if anyone's listening that like wants to do something like have their own ministry or have their own business. But if that's your aspiration goal, then definitely heed that advice because it starts very small. It starts with your next door mm-hmm. neighbor, your coworker. And from there it's, you know how God works. You give, he gives you a little and yeah. you're faithful with it. Then he'll trust you with more. And what little looks like is just what's happening in your day to day. There's broken people with you that you rub shoulders with every day that yeah, the Lord probably wants that's to good. use you. Yeah. Yeah. You've made this huge issue a lot easier yeah. to like <laughs> be a part of and, yes. and make progress in. So that's really helpful for me as well. Yeah. Just like knowing that me being in, in these kids' lives is it's doing something. It is huge. Yep. Yeah. So where can the people find you? Is there anything they can be looking forward to? Yes. So you can find me in a lot of places. Um, the Penny Story has an Instagram, the Penny Story. Um, that's not, you're not going to see any of my like personal life. That's going to be very much focused on trapping awareness and kind of the Penny Story 2.0 type of message that everyone is worthy. And then if you want to follow me personally on Instagram, that you will see my very much my personal life, my dog, my cat, my face, <laughs> all the things. Um, I, do, I love Instagram. People, you know, social media is super, can be awful, but I think it's wonderful. Like one of the reasons we're on this call right now is because social media has been able to keep us yeah. connected. So I think social media is a gift when it's used in the right way. So you can find me and my personal life on Kindle A Phillips. It looks like Kendala Phillips. And then the penny story, <laughs> please follow the penny story. And then things to look forward to. So Yeah, there's a lot to look forward to. Um, The Lord really just gave me someone who I've needed someone to come alongside me with the penny story because becoming a mom is a lot and I've needed help, but I don't necessarily, I don't know, I've needed help. And he provided that person in February and I've been able to have 
Betsy, who is, I'm pretty sure she's like Jesus in the flesh. I haven't figured it out yet. She is amazing. <laughs> she is my right hand person with the penny story. And we are, I have actually been talking like the past week about we're eight hours apart about getting together in December and just pl- for a few days to plan out so many things for the coming year. And so I can't even tell you what to look forward to, but I can tell you that she is a very busy mom. I am a very busy mom, but we both know the Lord has put the penny on our heart in the season and we're not going to neglect it, if that makes sense. So we are figuring out what does the next year look like for the penny. And I can tell you there will be more um, Penny Story 2.0 opportunities coming with mentoring. Either one, I do one, I call it mentoring over counseling. Mentoring is, it has a little more of like a, not a friendly feel to it, but I, my service Personal, that I provide is I call it intimate. mentorship over counseling. Um, I will be, I'll be launching more of that, my one-on-one services and group services with the new year. So I already do that, but it's kind of in a lull right now because I have a three month old baby. So I've been on maternity leave, mm-hmm. but in the new year, we will be doing more with the mentorship type of um, the penny story. So if you're hearing this and you're like, wow, I would love to be mentored then please let me know because we will keep you on a list to keep you updated on that. And then the penny's on time. That's all. Sometimes I'm like, is the penny story going to die? Because I feel like I'm dying in the role of mother. I'm not (laughs) dying, but it's just very consuming. And no, it is not. Um, The Lord provided Betsy and there are so many dreams we have. And now having where two or more are gathered, God is there. That's really how I feel with um, Betsy in the 2022 coming up for us. So we'll see what all the Lord has in store for the penny, but it's a lot because he's not letting it go away just because my season got busier so yeah good stuff all righty well of course thank you so much for coming on it's always a pleasure speaking with you i missed you it's so good (laughs) to see you thank you for having me of course so as you guys know um you can follow the parallel at the parallel pod on instagram you can join our patreon the description will be in uh wait what the link will be in the description (laughs) And uh, you guys will get access to uh, what free listeners do not have access to. Um, And as you guys know, remember to always speak the truth in love. Bye. 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 Bye.